this sure enough, this come from Elvis country. So uh, we're nationally recognized for the quality of the product we have because we've been doing it this way for 35 years. And we can't travel. You can't haul these fish around because they'll be sticky and mushy. And this comment of all the other states are doing it, I'll tell you that we're doing a better job than they are. And we're being rewarded for it with this kind of stuff. And here's the sad part about this for me today the majority of the things that Bobby has mentioned are workable, but this egg screening thing puts me out of business. This nice lady right here at sales to me, she can't function like she's doing, if, if y'all allow that. But the, the, the biggest issue though that I say to you is, and it's unfortunate for you, is, is you get a hours worth of information thrown at you to try to decide something that's far more complicated than that. The, I'll, I'll just speak a minute on the export. Uh, the way the export works is I will apply for a permit, say I have a customer in Japan. I will do business and I will, I will get that customer and the, the customer will agree to buy my product and I will apply to the fish and wildlife people for that permit they will turn around and contact the state and they will ask the state, did those fish Mr. Kelly caught, did it endanger the survival of the species? And the state will rule on it, yes or no. So the state's in control of whether we get a permit. Yes, U.S. Fish and Wildlife issues it, but they issue it based on state response. Oklahoma's getting fish permits with no fish size because the state is responding positively. I could go on and on and on, but you know, I'm, I'm asking you today, there's several people that are gonna have several reasons for different things, but, but the screening of the eggs is a train wreck deal breaker for me, for me personally. And some of the other stuff is workable, but everybody needs a chance. And how do you get all you need in this kind of setting? Public comment for 45 days and receiving a phone call and a letter. I, I, I'm sorry, that may be the process, but that's how, that's how it wound up in court five years ago. You just can't get it all like that. It's more complicated than that. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Would you please state your name and where you're from, please? Lucas Hale. I'm with American Pearl, KBR out of Savannah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've had the chance the last year to go down to Alabama and work there with their fish. I can tell you with the having to keep the fish in the body for such amount of time, there is a quality concern. Um, I've seen it down there. I've worked caviar eggs here in Tennessee. I've worked the eggs down there. Down there was a lot softer, you lost a lot more product. And just the overall egg, like Mr. Kelly said, it's a softer egg than a fresh screen, you know, as quick as you can get to it. Um, Alabama is conducting a study out of Auburn. I don't know, y'all can maybe find that. But they are doing a study on it. It'll be more current than the Patoli report. Um, the new facilities, um, I don't know too many fishermen that have HACCP, to be honest with you. There's, I know there's a few, but most of them don't have a HACCP, so who will cover that HACCP at, that, at these facilities? Um, there's been rumors going through fishermen that you'll have to ship the KVR out from that station to someone somewhere. I don't know if that's true, if it's a rumor, but that puts me and my two kids out of a job when you do that. That puts me completely out. Um, the decline in the, the fish, I'm telling you guys, it's 90% on the water. My guys in West Tennessee, 
they don't get to fish because the water's so high constantly. They, and they have to travel to East Tennessee or Cumberland. It's strictly water. If we could get the water turned down and we can actually fish, have time to fish, I promise you'll see the numbers go back up. Um, the, I heard something about different color eggs. I've processed up to 100 egg fish a day. There's different shades in eggs. It's just a characteristic of it. In Alabama, I didn't see it. Everything was still gray color. In Tennessee, you have green, you have gray, you have just tremendous amount of colors and shades. And another thing that's hurting us, Oklahoma, their caviar is free. They have no overhead. How can we compete as a company? This is not y'all's problem, but it's a state of Tennessee problem, at least with the buyers. Um, how can we compete with a product that's free? Did you state there would be different color eggs from the same fish? It's not exactly a different color, but there's different shades throughout the fish. It'll be a green, but you'll see there's blimps in there, what we call for when they spawn, big, big old white blimps in there. And there will be a different shade throughout the fish, you know, some darker colors, some lighter colors. And I've seen it done with eggs that were screened in my facility right in front of me. So I know there was no switching being done because I will sit there and watch them being screened. So I know there is different shades. And we do a lot of caviar. I've seen a lot of caviar. I process all of our caviar. So I see a lot of caviar over the course of a day, a year, a season. And an outlaw is an outlaw, and I don't think anything you do is going to stop an outlaw. If he has intentions in breaking the law, he's going to find a way around it. And I, none of my fishermen do it, I make sure. But if a man is going to break a law, we all know he's going to find a way around it. Thank you, sir. And one more thing. Uh, we're going to talk about the decline mortality. We still have a hatchery. We hatched them off. We stocked them in 2001. It's still sitting right beside my building. We still offer the service to the state. We would be willing to stock all the bodies of water that take everything we take out. We'd be willing to put back, do our job. That way it helps everybody here and we don't have a problem doing that. Yeah, we did it 2001, we stopped. I don't know how many it was, it was a lot. And we still have that technology, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cannon, did you have a question? Mr. Kelly, I think you want to say one other thing. Yeah, I don't take up all the time. I just kind of see something here. I want to clarify this term, this term HACCP and the HACCP facility and maybe educate you a little more on that. First of all, you start off with a uh, health department inspected building like any restaurant in Tennessee. The local health department comes in, checks basic things, okay? So I'm assuming that there are buildings around the state that are open to the public to rent that the health department inspects the cleanliness and make sure they have a hot water heater and, and, a, and that kind of thing. That's a building. A HACCP plan, a HACCP plan is a designed plan specifically designed for the production of a product, in this case, caviar. So I have a plan, the Hales have a plan, uh, it involves many things, where did the fish come from, and, 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 uh, but mostly the, the part of the plan is once you start the actual curing of the product, which is not going on in the boat, the actual rewashing and recleaning and salting and draining of salt and packaging in the the packages that you're going to sell the product in. And this is a plan that has to be step by step by step by step. The salting of the product has to be, the documentation has to be kept on how much salt did you put in the product. Then laboratory analysis have to be 
uh, they are requested by the FDA that I, we do a laboratory analysis three times a season to prove that the acceptable amount of salt is in the product. And then there are also in the HACCP plan temperature control guidelines that, that, the, that the cooler that you're keeping the product in has to be maintained at a certain temperature and documented, has to have a continuous monitor. I have a, I have a device that's in my cooler that monitors my temperature 24 hours a day and I have to provide those records upon inspection from the FDA and so do these folks. So to say that you can have a fisherman to run in a building somewhere and clean a fish and have a HACCP plant all ready and to document the temperature 24 hours a day and document the temperature of the storage of the caviar till it's sold and all that goes on with this. We also have to be registered with uh, Homeland Security because of providing food to the public to prevent food terrorism. That, that's also part of our deal that, that we have to do. And so this is way more complicated than telling a fisherman he can run in a building somewhere just because it's health to prove to clean a fish. It's just, it's just way more than that. Uh, had something else I was going to tell you, but it must not have been important. I forgot it. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, thank so you. So as it stands now, Mr. Kelly, when, you, when you're processing the fish on the boat, I assume your fishermen put them on a cooler. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay, and then you, and then they're taking those fish. How far do they have to take them before they get them to well, you? Well, let's, 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 let's take an example of Monday morning, December the 1st. Monday morning, December the 1st, I'll have fisherman number one that decided he wanted to go to Chickamauga. That's 230 miles. On the same Monday morning, December the 1st, I got a guy woke up and he decided he wanted to go to Cumberland City. That's 150 miles from my place. And on the same morning, I had another fisherman that wanted to go to Parish Landing on Kentucky Lake, and that's 108 or 10 miles from my place. Okay? They take the product, like you saw there, and they put it on ice, and it's iced down right there, and it stays iced down until they finish their work and get it back to me, and, which, and sometimes that's the next morning. But, but how am I going to, how, how, ever where these guys fish, you can't have a, person there with a HACCP plan with all this going on, not to mention this, not to mention this, the federal guidelines for the preservation of seafood, if you had a shrimping vessel that went out for a week, and they do do that, and if you had a tuna boat that went out for a week, and they do do that, if they were not allowed to gut the fish and wash the fish and ice the fish, how would you ever have a safe product? Mr. Federal Kelly. guidelines allow that. But can I ask a question? That's, That's what we're doing in the boat. We're, we're, we're. I understand that, but the preventing the, the compromise, as I understand it, is just taking the fish from the water where you caught it to the bank. So I mean, we're just talking about that length of time. We're not talking about how to get it to you. It, but it, so create, saying, it creates so many more problems that you can't see not being a fisherman, and, and they can't see because they're not fishermen. If I've got a guy who has put the boat in and went down river 20 miles, and he's got 12 nets, what they're asking for, and he catches the biggest, nicest female egg fish in the first net of the day, and then he has to pull those other 12 nets and he's having a little problem and he, it takes him four, five, or six hours. There's a lot of work involved. And then he's six or seven hours. Is he gonna, every time he catches a fish, run 20 miles back to the truck? May I, may I ask a question? Is that required or do they just, can they not process these, these fish somewhere other than on their boat? As oh. I understand it, uh, the, the, while the paddlefish are on their vessel, they have to be whole. That's what we're proposing. That's what they're asking for. Okay. Right. But you can go to, he doesn't have to go to the boat ramp where he put in, does he, to, to 
But we're proposing that they have to go back to the boat ramp that they took out from for enforcement purposes. Okay. And I, I should point out the compromise. This is a compromise that we proposed. Uh, there's been some confusion about the HACCP. The original recommendation said they, they could take it to an approved HACCP facility. Well, it, this we've, we've dropped that. We will be willing to accept this compromise, which doesn't even mention anything about HACCP at all. The HACCP, we don't enforce HACCP. Uh, that was just a, for information only. Um, do, do most commercial fishermen fish by themselves? I mean, there's not a process where somebody could be running fish and cleaning them while others are working nets. I mean, people, I, people fish. You're talking when you're talking about Kentucky Lake. You're talking about 125 or maybe 140 miles of that's in Tennessee. Them guys go where they want to, and they're sometimes they're up together, and sometimes they're 100 miles apart. A situation where there's more than one person. I mean, does one person pull the they'll nets have, up? They'll have a helper in the boat with them. Some of them will, yeah. But we don't have two boats. But you, you, you're, you're, here's the point I, I really want to make big time. And it, hopefully this will really sink into you. Twelve years ago when Mr. Cox come on this and we're, we're revisiting the same subject, he, he's tasted some caviar that's been made here. So if I was going to ask you today, every one of you, to put this in your mouth and swallow it, had you rather have it where we have taken it out of the fish as soon as we caught it and iced it down and kept it cold, or had you rather have them hauling it around in the boat all day and then you put it in your mouth? I'm going to sit down after I make one more statement. I'm 54 years old. I've been involved in fishing since I was 15. I got a teenage boy that every day in the world wants me to give him something out of my billfold. And I've still got to put him through. You, you can't help me with that. <laughs> the, here's the point I want to make by saying that. I've got to put him through college. The worst thing that could ever happen to me is to, to not have paddlefish to catch. And I'm not worried about them being endangered. I got a question for, for Mike. The proposal is to make the fishermen go back to where the, their trucks parked. This is a question for you. If the, if, if the fishermen now are, are, are taken out of their nets and they're running out to the middle of the lake to get away from the bank to to throw small fish in to, to do whatever they're doing to process if they could go to a public boat ramp nearest the place where their net is set and pull up on the boat ramp without they don't have to trailer it just pull up there and stop where if there was an officer there he could check them would that would that satisfy you no because you're still you're still running long areas on the water and you're still at times catching the big prize the first the first net of the day and sometimes the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour and we're working in waves this high and so you're going to run 10 miles back to the truck and all that rough water and deal with one fish and then you're going to turn around and run But I'm not talking about going back to where you put in. I'm talking about going to the nearest public ramp. Mr. Kelly, can you come back up so we can get this through the mic? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm That's talking about right. getting you to the nearest public ramp, not going back where your truck is, but if you've passed two ramps and you can go back, run 10 what? minutes back up there to do what you got to do. Where are you going to put the finished product if you do that? <laughs> what, I mean, then if you put it in the boat? Put it, you put it in the same place you would if you went to the middle and processed it. No. He'd have to have a boat, a, a vehicle there to put his pro processed eggs in while it goes back out. Yeah, right. Couldn't be in possession of possessed, uh, processed eggs while on the water. May I ask, sir? I, I, need you, I need you to come up here and state your name. I guess most of you know me. I'm Frank Hale. I'm 
the old connoisseur of American caviar, what they're speaking of, a fisherman's out there and he catches four fish in his first 12 nets, then he's got to run all these other 12 nets, which takes time, when it's detrimental to the caviar to get it out and process it within an hour. So what he has to do is stop his boat, stop pulling nets, process the caviar in order to have quality. So. Uh, Commissioner Clark? So you're saying even though you're, it's cool weather, even though you, do you put the fish on ice immediately or do you just lay them in the boat? Can you not? Uh, here's my experience in this. W weather is a little bit of a factor, but it's the, the, the biggest, biggest deal in this Y'all saw that picture. By the way, that was that same lady that had that blood on her hands. That was, she was running those eggs through that wire, okay? The big deal on that is the, soon, the sooner you can do that, the less of them you tear up or bust or break. And that's why in that article it said that that product was mushy. And that's why it said ours wasn't. So, so in January when it's 25 degrees, the, fee, the eggs are a little harder than they are in April when it's warmer. But it's still just as important when you run them through that screen. That's the key. We're having to come in here and tell our trade secrets. <laughs> well, I know I'm not, you're right, I'm not a paddle fisherman and I'm learning. But I know I'm a crappie fisherman, so and it's important we keep them cold, and you don't want to dress them. I mean, keep it'll, they'll definitely affect the quality of the fish. But we're not allowed to clean them out there. We have to wait and come in and keep them really good and cold, even while you're cleaning them. And so if the colder you can keep them, the better quality your fish are. I just wondered if the row is the same way. It is. The colder you can keep it, and the sooner you can get it on ice. No different than any other fish you'd catch. Well, Saturday. when you throw, like when you showed us that picture of the, all the fish in the bottom of the boat, there, is that the way it's normally done? They're not, they're just in the boat well, until you get? Well, one of the other things, again, uh, I'll show it to you or you can trust me to tell you. I brought the okay. regulations with me and I brought <laughs> the regulations where the commission worked through all this subject matter before. And the compromise that was made and the blocking of the fish. And in these regulations, I asked for five years in front of the commission for a needle to check the fish for eggs. Because what we started doing as a fishing community is we check them for eggs and we throw everything back. So what's not on that graph is 40-inch spoonbill that paddle fish, 40-inch fish that we've checked with this needle that don't have eggs that we're putting back. So I, I think we're down to now about, we're keeping about eight fish out of 100. And we're throwing back all other sizes, including fish that are bigger than the size limit. 36, 37, 38, 39s, 40s, 42s that we have checked with this needle and we're putting them back. These fish don't have row every year, we've learned. And we've learned as an industry, if it's 40 inches long and it doesn't have row in it, it's financially benefited to us to put it back. There's a whole lot going on. That, 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 that's why the, 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 this, being able just to present it like this, there is so much information out here. This man right here has shipped four or five export permits and he's got three briefcases full of stuff where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife responded as to why. Mr. Stroud? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Mike, I, and I, I hear you. We all do. And it's tough, but this is the way it is. But it seems to me, with you having also to run back and forth, we haven't looked at the financial side of this thing, which is fuel, right? And so, I mean, I, I, I get. And what, what Connie's talking about makes sense, too, about it being having to be chilled and so forth and we're not the experts you are and 
we're not the professionals and you are, so we appreciate putting up with our ignorance about this. But let me be even a little more ignorant. The reason why we're talking about this is because we're afraid that you're going to catch smaller fish and stick the eggs from the smaller fish. Is that why we're, we're insisting on this? Am I correct? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, that's the, re that's the reason, right? That's the main reason, yes. Okay, so the main reason is that you might act up. <clears throat> so, my, so my comment would be... So, so by, uh, here, here's what I'm saying. No, no, come on up if you want to, Mike. I mean, it, it, it's simple to me. I mean, if, 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 we're, if, it, if it, we're ruining the product, or it sounds like we might, and I don't know, but it's, there's some arguments there. And, if, and if, we're, if our main reason is because of somebody doing something that's not lawful, like you, or you, Frank, or someone like you, <coughs> then it sounds like to me that, it, that uh, we need to make the laws tougher to where you can never fish again if you get caught. And you say you got all these kind of fishermen guys and if they get a $500 fine or whatever, I mean, if it's not, if it's not, if, we, if it's coming to where we're having to talk about this because of the problems between guys stealing and, and, and acting up, like I say, make it so tough I don't know if that makes sense to you guys either, but make it so tough that you can't that you can't fish anymore. That you just you know you it's not three strikes and you're out. You're done. And I, I don't know, but maybe that's a, a something to look at down the road or, or something to talk about. But and if we're screwing up this this food, and if we're and I, again my ignorance about this. Um, well, yeah, I just keep getting thoughts like I said you just can't cover it all in a day but in the Patoli report he said the and I know you can go back and research this he said the most drastic form of management was limited entry and the committee did not fight that one we okayed it that's the Patoli that seems to be the gospel of paddlefish even though I've got a lot of problems with some of it he said the most drastic thing you can do to manage and still have a fishery is limited entry. And we're not here today fighting that recommendation. We're fighting one that will put us out and ruin our quality. Chairman Griggs. You come back up, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Some of these other guys yeah. are gonna want to talk. That's okay. I, I've got You've alluded two different times to we have five cars of information. Are you sharing that with the agency? Do you call the agency? This is 15 years old for me. Same stuff. That man right there has heard every bit of this 12 years ago. Okay. Is there somebody else from the public that would like to speak? Yes. 